If you will, let's stand together with Bibles open, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and the children are also dismissed at this time for Children's Church. Give a moment for our children to make their way. Deuteronomy chapter 7. A sermon I have entitled, Who Are God's People? We will look at these first few verses together and survey the rest of the chapter. Verse 1 says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. When the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them, show no mercy to them. You shall not intermarry with them giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their asherim and burn their carved images with fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Lord, we ask you that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word. Father, we pray that it would speak to our heart and mind as we survey these verses together and as we glance into the new covenant. Father, I pray that our hope and our trust will be secure in Christ Jesus. And we can say, who are God's people? We are those who are in Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in His name. Amen. You may be seated. Now one of the most memorable and one of the most tragic events to ever happen to the United States, particularly on United States soil in the last 50 years even, is the attack on America, more specifically, the attack on New York City on September the 11th, 2001. For those that were part of World War II, it would have been the horrible attack of, of Pearl Harbor. For those in the past 50 years up till this day, it would be the terrorist attacks on that dreadful day, September the 11th. Now, amongst most expositors, most Amongst most preachers today, the events that happened on that day are probably one of the most used in sermon illustrations to the day. And so I'll use this particular event as an illustration as well to make a point to ask the question, who are God's people? After the events of 9-11, there was a rally cry across the United States, across America, for Americans to join hand in hand and to raise their voices to God in prayer. These were prayers to God to heal our nation. Those prayers are good, right? Heal our nation, oh God. They were prayers to bring justice on the attackers, to bring peace and unity. According to the National Day of Prayer organization, they say for weeks and months following the 9-11 attacks, our sanctuaries were full. I don't know if you remember those days. I remember that next Sunday after the attack, our church was slam-packed with people. Sanctuaries were full. People reached out to God and cried out to God, searching for meaning. They rallied together in a real spirit of what it seemed to be at the time, a spirit of unity. However, our churches quickly emptied and spiritual apathy resettled over our country. 
People were calling out to God. And it seems that the Lord might even use these events as a catalyst to build the bridge for evangelism and for revival. And somehow I could say I lived during that time and saw what was happening during that time, what seemed to be a good stepping stone for revival and for evangelism, but somehow the church just simply dropped the baton. Looking back, this was nothing more than a calling on God as if he was like some cosmic grandfather in the sky. Maybe he was a cosmic busboy or genie and rubbing the, the, the genie bottle and here comes God, this grandfatherly figure who would come and answer our cries if we need him, but would be totally transcendent any other time. See, the United States loved the idea of God, but they hated the name of Jesus. It was not so much the name of Jesus, but what the name of Jesus stood for at this time. That was the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that there is no other name under heaven in which men might be saved. No man comes to the Father except through Jesus. And so, yeah, we love the idea of God. As long as he didn't encroach upon our personal space. It hated the name of Jesus, but it called for us to trust in him exclusively. It was also during this time, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary to hear a celebrity on television say something like, we are all God's children. Are we all just God's children? And that is the question I want to answer today, specifically from Deuteronomy and other verses in mind. The question is this, who are God's children? People, I will submit to you and build the case that only people who are in Christ Jesus are God's people. We might hear this, who are God's people? The question posed as to say, shouldn't we love one another? Yes. Are we all in this together? I don't know. But the question is, who are God's people? People, I submit to you, only those who are in Christ Jesus are God's people. Yes, as human beings, we are created in the image and the likeness of God. But how dangerous it is to hold to such false and dangerous ideas that we can approach God without the work of Jesus. So, thinking with our Bibles open a Christ follower or God's people bear certain fruit in their life. In Galatians 5 kind of lay out this, the fruit of the Spirit as in opposition to the work of the flesh. But there are some characteristics of God's people that will, that will become evident. Number one, God's people follow His commands for His glory. We follow the commands of the Lord for His glory. We have mentioned this truth before as we have been working through Deuteronomy that the word of the Lord is replete with commands and, and imperatives. In fact, there are 1,050 so imperatives in the New Testament alone, not to mention those that in the, are in the Old Covenant, not to mention those that are implied in the text. But once we understand the motives of God Almighty as to His commands... It helps to enrich our lives as believers with the goal of perpetual, ongoing human flourishing or sh shalom or peace. And we only find this true balance of peace and shalom through the Lord Jesus. So it only makes sense to follow God's imperatives. In the Old Testament, it is said of the adherence to the commands with the motives intact. What is the commands? What are the motives of these commands? It is so that you might live. So verse 1, where God's people follow His commands for His glory. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, all the sites here in this League of Nations. He says that they are more numerous amongst you. They are mightier than 
than you. And by the way, this is a theme in Scripture. There might be nations around you that are mightier than you. There might be people even around you that are mightier than you. But the God that we serve is mightier than all. The promise of God is always at the forefront for contemplation and for remembrance. In fact, Deuteronomy, the the bedrock of Deuteronomy is a second giving of the law, a remembering of what God has done, a, a passing it on to a new generation. Remember how God brought you out of Egypt and when the Lord brings you into the land that he promises. Remember the day when you became a believer in the Lord Jesus and he washed your sins away. Remember that day when you passed from death into life. Remember that day when you said yes to the Lord Jesus. Remember that day when God brought you out of Egypt. See, hundreds of years have separated them from the first time that they heard this catalog of this League of Nations that we find in Genesis 15, 19 through 21. And and here they are again. And God says that he will clear them away. These seven nations that are mightier than you. Here these occupying nations are more in number. They are more robust. Some being mightier in stature, even mighty warriors, even in the land. There were 10 nations and in somehow through conquest that three of these nations were conquered by the other, absorbed into the other But just remember this, this League of Nations is nothing compared to the God of Israel. They are mightier than you, but they are not mightier than the God that you serve. And there are tons of applications we can lay at our feet this morning that we serve a God that is mightier than any issue and problem that we might have in in life. Verse 2 says this, And when the Lord your God gives them over to you to defeat them, you must devote them to complete destruction, You shall make no covenant with them, and you will show no mercy. So, as it seems, this is an all-or-nothing scenario. We have encountered this question before in the text, that the Lord is commanding a total destruction of a people group. I want you to remember the undertone that we said. God had commanded people to go out, and Moses, you were to conquer the Amalekites, or... You are to conquer a certain people group and devote them to total destruction. Remember the undertone here as drastic times calls for drastic measures. Now that might be an oversimplistic answer to this question, but it is, it is a good reminder for us to take off our Western lenses as we read Scripture. Because it is hard for us to immerse ourselves in this primitive culture unless we somehow, in some way, divorce ourselves from the Western mindset that many of us hold to. In fact, there might be skeptics today who might say, well, see, God is supposed to be this all-loving God, and now here he is commanding all of this particular people group to be eradicated from the face of the earth. They might be radical uh, atheist or agnostic or whatever, unbelievers or cynical or whatever it might be, who has really no intent whatsoever to making sure that you are correctly reading the text, but to somehow discredit the God of Israel, the God that we serve. And so it is important for us to take off our Western lenses and to immerse ourselves in a primitive culture. This culture is one that was constantly in strife all around. All these nations that are mentioned threaten the very lineage of the coming Messiah. And by the way, the coming Messiah is not just Israel's Messiah. He is our Messiah as well. And so all of these nations threaten the very lineage of the Messiah. Drastic times calling for drastic measures. The command is to make no covenant with them, no alliance with them. They will turn their back on them and will destroy the people of Israel had they not done what the Lord commanded them to do. I want you to think about it for a moment. All right, before we, before we are placed in this sympathetic mindset, why didn't God spare these folks? The Israel were about to enter into a land that was a country full of idolaters. They were full of child murderers, etc. And again, before our human sympathies kick in over 
the people that are described here in this League of Nations, here's some food for thought. Gods of the Amorites, the God of the Canaanites, etc., had engaged in child sacrifice and multiple other perversions. You know how we are to count our blessings, name them one by one. You heard the song? song? We could count the offenses and name them one by one amongst the Canaanites and Amorites and then this league of nations. They served Asherah and Baal and graven images. And God judged the murder of the innocent. And as God judged the murder of the innocent, I will submit to you that he does so still today. In short, they were unrepentant trespassers, strangers in a strange land. They were occupying the land that was promised to Israel. There are occasions in the Bible where you read such sobering thoughts and words where we see the immediate divine justice from from God announcing this judgment and then carried out almost immediately. And this is one of those occasions. Not only are you to go in and to destroy utterly, you are not to intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. And I do feel the need to stop at this point. I feel the need to stop and address this just a little bit closer. I have had several people over my years in the ministries that would ask, such questions, doesn't this, doesn't the Bible forbid interracial marriages? And what I find here is not the word interracial, but to intermarry. And by the way, if we were to just read a little bit further, you would find the answer as to why they were forbidden. And some would ask this question, doesn't the Bible forbid interracial marriages? And in the context of ancient Israel, it is Not to intermarry, but there is a point to this. The reason that they were forbidden to intermarry in the Old Testament was due to the people adopting their false gods and idols. It had nothing to do with skin color. See, King Solomon is a great example of how this plays out. You get that many wives and concubines in the same home. You know, I've heard people say, you know, I'm just going to marry that man. He ain't saved. Or I'm going to marry that woman. They're not saved. And I'm going to pray and they're going to get saved. But what we find time and again, what ends up happening is the unbeliever actually begins to drag down the believer. Sometimes God does save. And for that, we say, amen. Thank you, Lord, for that. But there is a reason. It is not to intermarry because there is skin color involved or even cultural differences. It is just simply that they would adopt the false gods. They would bring these idols and gods into their home. If we would just simply read on, we would find the answers to this. Verse 4, for they will turn away your sons from what? From following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will destroy you quickly. There's your reasoning. You know why I think that the evidence that why sometimes we become biblical illiterate are things like this. Find the text and read. We will get the answer in the text. Now, there's your reasoning in the ancient context. But there are people... I submit to you who are radically racist who will twist this scripture to say that people should not intermarry. I have had people who asked this question to me who were well-meaning, Christ-following people who wanted to have the answer. Their motives were pure. Their motives were correct. But there is a list of folks who are radically racist who will twist this, this scripture out of its context to that it is hardly recognizable anymore to say that people shouldn't intermarry within their race and it does not say there is a, a prohibition against interracial marriages. Now, that might not set too well with you this morning, but I want you to listen to what I say next. I would rather have my boys marry a black girl who was a follower of Jesus than a white girl who is an unbeliever. I would rather for them to marry someone who is a believer than to follow someone and to marry someone who is an unbeliever. White, red, yellow, black, white, green, it don't matter, the skin color. 
Now, where do we find that in the New Testament context? Just so we are not just in Deuteronomy. All of God's word is God's word. Amen. But we find this when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Very familiar verse where he says, do not be what? Unequally yoked with unbelievers. That is the context in Deuteronomy. Not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? lawlessness? What part does Israel have to play who's supposed to worship the one true God with these other idols and other gods? It is a matter of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and being a follower of Christ. Has nothing, listen to me, has nothing to do with skin color. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? And like Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. So let's move on. Verse 5. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram or their ritual pillars and, and burn their, cra their carved images with fire. These places were usually planted on hills and was close to pagan temples. And these are the types of places where idols would be placed and displayed for worship. These are places that are also called trees of adoration under which they would, this would be their house of worship. Against the Canaanites and people were all types of idol worshipers and services of prostitu prostitution and Involving their priests and their priestesses that were engaged in all type of immorality. And we spoke of this often in the realm of tearing down idols and tearing down idols in our life and stripping them away from us. But this is the literal tearing down, the breaking down of those idols amongst the pagan nations. A visualization of a tearing down, a trampling down of idols. And we see it all in God's word when the people were doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord instead of what was evil in the sight of God. So not only were they to strip away the idols, but all and any paraphernalia or anything that might be a reminder or a temptation for them. I, I remember when I first started smoking. When I went into it, I went into it hardcore. So what I mean by that, I was smoking two packs a day. And I remember to myself, I'm going to quit smoking. And I made a decision often that I was going to quit smoking. That I was going to quit. And if I had a fresh pack of cigarettes, I remember I would take out one. I want to smoke one last cigarette. And what I would do with that pack of, this cigar that pack of cigarettes determined what my heart and mind was already in key of. Was already determined to do. So I would take that pack of cigarettes. And I would put it in the top of my closet. Is that any indication that I'm ready to quit? Because, hey, at the end of the day, just in case, just in case I can't hang, that pack of cigarettes is right there. But I'll tell you, every time I walked by that closet in my room, it was like I smelled that fresh tobacco. It was, te it was tempting. It told me that my heart and mind was not ready to give it up. I would put them on that top closet just in case. Instead of the trash can, I would submit to you that those idols and those temptations we need to throw away with the help of the Holy Spirit. Throw those away, cast those things away, those things that might be tempting to you. Before the end of the day, I was already back in the pack of cigarettes open and I was smoking again. Same can go for us today. If there's anything that is tempting you into sin, tear it down, destroy it, move it away from you. It seems so commonsensical here, and yet it is a constant struggle for many of us. Idols, even in their inanimate state, where there is no breath at all, distract us from Christ more than what we would like to admit. The things that are inanimate have no breath in them whatsoever, distract us away from our adoration to King Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, Nothing teaches us about the, the preciousness of the Creator as much as when we learn the emptiness of everything else. The emptiness of everything else. So Israel is to tear down these places because worship is only allotted to God Almighty. Why? Verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. 
The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his possession. Out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. And so just to recap, Israel is chosen for the purpose of bringing glory to God and the Messiah to the world. That this is the sustainable reasons that we have why Israel is chosen. So in this sermon, there are two questions that sometimes become prevalent. One thing that I mentioned already, where in the Bible does it say, or does the Bible forbid interracial marriage? The second question that often comes up is, why did God choose Israel? You ever thought about that? Why did God choose Israel as a people? So those are two questions, big questions that we're handling in the text today. People ask all the time, why did God choose Israel? A good response of that would be, besides those that I have relayed um, in the next two verses, we find this, verse 7. So let's look at this first. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. I've underlined that for uh, your notes and for my notes, that you were the fewest amongst all people. And if we could interject something there, it would be that it is by His grace. It is, if we could interject, it is by grace you have been saved and not of works, I believe that we could interject that verse here. Ephesians 2, verse 9. We can, we can, inter, we can interject that here. He says, but it is because... The Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to you, your fathers. And the Lord has brought you out of, by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the, how, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So, why did God choose Israel? First and foremost, very simply put, because he is sovereign, which means that he is in control. What do I mean by that? We, we think that we have a little control over the things in our life, don't we? Sometimes we like to think of ourselves as control freaks. And sometimes I can be a control freak. And there are many people that I know who say, hey, I'm a control freak. That's just how I am. But think about the Lord of the universe. When we say sovereign, this is what we mean. That he is in control of all facets of the cosmos, of the universe. And then on top of that, of every possible word, world that ever exists. And in eternality of scenarios. And in the end, it all points to Jesus. And he is in control and he is sovereign in all of that and in anything that could possibly exist. Moses reminds them again, remember the work of the Lord, how he saved you from bondage and he, and he kept his promises to you. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God. He is faithful. He keeps his covenants. His steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And then he repays those to their face, those who hate him, by destroying them. And he will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Now this last portion of this text gives good indication that God's promises are not confined to the Jewish people alone. They find resolution in the finished work of Christ. There is a key phrase that is mentioned here, 2,000 generations and that might necess necessarily be an exact literal number, thousands, but that, but that this redeeming factor of God's good grace and love will extend on to generations to the finished work of Christ. The image of this person who loves God and keeps his commandments is not, I better keep God's commandments or he will strike me down where I stand, but rather... I will keep the commandments of God because I love the Lord. I remember a pastor back home used to say that there are many promises in the Bible. Some I want and others I don't. God's people follow the commands of the Lord to give Him glory. The ultimate goal of any follower of Christ is to, is to bring glory to His name. That is our goal. I will say this, I know you might say, well, what is, I might ask you, what is your goal as a Christ follower? You would say, well, uh, I, I, want to, I want to make heaven my home. That's a good goal, I think. But the goal for any believer, and every believer, isn't heaven. And you might gasp for a moment as what, as what I just said. It is not heaven. That's the benefit. The ultimate goal isn't even evangelism, although we are 
although we are uh, designed for evangelism, if it is bringing glory to Christ, and if by evangelizing and outreaching and worshiping together, we bring glory to his name, well then, amen. If we make heaven our home, amen. But we will only make heaven our home through the work of Christ and for his glory and for his honor. By following the teaching of our Lord and for his, his word, we bring glory to Christ. And if the command for you right now is to tear down idols, we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit and by his glory. If the command is to forgive, to love one another, we can't do that in and of ourselves or by ourselves, then we do so by his power and for his glory. I read this on the great classical composer J.S. Bach, and it reminded me of the goal of every believer to give glory to God. Listen to this. J.S. Bach said, All music should have no other end and aim than the glory of God and the soul's refreshment. Where this is not remembered, there is no real music but only a devilish hubbub. He headed every composition with this. JJ, which stood for Jesus Juva, which, which means Jesus help me. And then he would end his score with SDG, which means Sole de Gratia, which means to God alone the praise. Glory to God alone. To God alone get the praise. And that is the goal of every believer, to give God the glory. Secondly, God's people follow his commands because they love him. We were reminded of this in 1 John 2 and verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, Moses then continues to proclaim in verse 11. So follow with me, if you will, from verse 11 on down. We'll read these verses together in conclusion. He says that you shall therefore be careful to do the commandment, the commandment and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. And because you listen to these rules and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that he swore to your fathers. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your wine, and your oil, and increase on your herds and the young of your flock in the land that he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all people. There shall, be not, there shall not be male or female that is barren amongst you or amongst your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew will he inflict on you, but he will, uh, he will lay them on all who hate you. And you shall consume all the peoples that the Lord your God will give over to you. Your eyes shall not pity them, neither shall you serve their gods. For that will be a snare to you. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, the wonders, the mighty hand, and the outstretched arm which the Lord your God brought you out. So will the Lord your God do to all peoples of whom you are not afraid. Moreover, the Lord God will send hornets amongst them until those who are left and hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be in dread of them, for the Lord your God is in your midst, a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will clear away these nations before you, little by little. You may not make an end of them at once, lest the wild beast grow too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will give them over to you and throw them into great confusion until they are destroyed." And he will give their kings into your hands, and you shall make their name perish from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. The carved images of their gods you shall burn with fire. You shall not cover the silver or gold that is on them, or take it for yourself, lest you be ensnared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God, and you shall not bring an abomination, an abominable thing into your house and become devoted to its destruction like it. You shall utterly detest and abhor it, for it is devoted to destruction. Clear discourse on distancing from the unbeliever, from distancing yourself from sin in this regard. Not to take on sin itself. The Lord has always been clear and concise with his purpose. And this is why we hear him reminding the people of his commands in that last portion of scripture. 
And the whole next chapter, chapter 8, is a reminder of the Lord's work amongst His people. Why? It is because we falter so fast. Because we fail so fast. For those that love the Lord and who abide in Christ will keep His commandments. And to have the indwelt Holy Spirit, you cannot do anything else but to obey the Lord and to want to please Him. Martin Luther once said, Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that really is your God, your functional Savior. For if you love the Lord Jesus, you will cling to Him. Charles Stanford, who was a one-time shoemaker, he was a, a lawyer's clerk, a bookseller, a preacher of the 1800s, had this to say of sin in the gospel. So we ask this question, who are God's people? It is those who look like Christ. It is those who abide in Christ. And the Bible says if we love Him, we will do what? Keep His commandments. He's had this to say. He said, a soldier's uniform is to be worn only by a soldier. A student's gown is only to be worn by a student. A saint's robe only by a saint. As we call him a soldier who has only just enlisted, as we call him a student who has only just entered college, we call him a saint who has only just begun to believe and has yet everything to learn and everything to feel that belongs to the sanctified life. Still, a saint, he must be one whose vocation is to be holy and who strives daily to obey the divine voice within him that is ever saying, sin not, sin not, sin not, or he can have no interest in the Savior's righteousness. If you love the Lord Jesus, you will keep his word. Who are God's people? Those who abide in Christ and keep his commandments. Let's pray together.